Joanne, what is it? John, what, what's your authority for that? Uh, no, for the basis. Okay. Ashley, you had your hand half up. Just say it loudly. 10 So what's the basis normally? It's carried away. So it would be 200,000, right? But Stephanie says you're wrong, right, Ashley? And Stephanie, you're challenging Ashley. Section 1016 says no adjustment should be made for taxes or other parents or parents. Section 266. Okay, but Stephanie, you're you're putting your job on the line. You're I'm the client, I'm the supervisor, you're saying it's 260, so go for it. Why did you say 260 not 200, Stephanie? Um, just because I was taking 200 and then I was adding the um, 60 tax. Okay, you know what my next question is. What's your basis? What's your authority? What's your Is it just, you know, is it just, <laughs> and would you ever take such a favorable position for your client, knowing that your job or malpractice suit was on the line? Um, 1015D. Okay, you want to read it to us so that. Um, in this basis for gift tax paid in general, if A, the property is acquired by gift on or after September 2nd, 1958, the basis shall be the basis. Under subsection A, increase um, by the amount of gift tax paid with respect to such gift. All right, so stop. So, Stephanie, you're feeling pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Is okay. it a yes or no? Sure. Do you have a watch on? No. Do you have a so, cell phone? Huh? Do you have a cell phone? Yeah. You, can you check it for a sec? Is it after 1976? Yeah. You look at 1015 D6. What does it say, Stephanie? Uh, in case of any gift made after December 31st, okay. 1976. Oh, you think that might be relevant? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep going. <laughs> Provided by the subsection with respect to any gift or gift tax paid under Chapter 12 shall be an amount which bears the same ratio to the amount of tax so paid as that appreciation and value of the gift bears to the amount of the gift. All right, so Stephanie, they're asking, they're saying that you don't get <coughs> an increase by the entire gift tax paid, okay? It's, and I have a lousy magic marker, I apologize, see if this one works better. It's the gift tax paid times, what's the numerator and denominator? The numerator is the net appreciation. What's the new net appreciation here? 100,000. What's the amount of the gift, Stephanie? Uh, two, 200. No, how much did it, a, a net a get? Oh, uh, No, at the end, when she got the gift, what was the amount of the gift, Jesse? <coughs> it was $60. No, no, no. How much was the gift, not the gift tax paid? $300. 300 right? So, what is the basis here? <coughs> Say again? Be 220,000 guys. Last I checked, 60 times one third is 20. So it'd be 200 plus 20 is 220. So the gain here would be 100,000. <coughs> Everyone see this? Banana. Where did we get the what? Look. At 1015D6, it says, <coughs> read the language, it says, shall be an amount which bears the same ratio of the amount of tax so paid, what's the tax paid, 60? 
as the net appreciation. The net appreciation at the time Lewis gave you this gift. He gave it to you when it was worth 300, right? And he had bought it for 200. That's the $100,000 difference. And the amount of the gift, right, Stephanie, right, Jesse, is 300,000, right? Yes. <clears throat> Brandon, you got that? Yeah. You see how dangerous it is, Stephanie, to stop reading? I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to give you a hard time because it's, look, we all like a good taxpayer answer, right? Everyone, wouldn't we all possibly fall trapped reading 10 to 15 to one because it's very, you know, our client loves when we can produce more bases. More bases than merit, right? And at first step, he's like, whoa, Grand Slam home run, got a $60,000 basis addition, you know, that's time to celebrate. But it truly isn't because if she had stopped reading and they called her supervisor or client, and you get a $60,000 basis, and subsequently it was learned that the basis should have been 20, and the client owes interest and penalties. Is the client gonna say, yeah, you're allowed a mistake, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the penalties. And the client's gonna say, you're gonna have to pay me dollar for dollar for the penalties, interest, and whatnot. So it's not a good day in the office. Just, you know, again, I've told you, when you practice tax, guys, not meant with a glass of wine in hand, double espresso, right? <laughs> Very intense sport, wow. right? But it doesn't say anything. Just sometimes hard. Yes, it doesn't say anything. And it's not sometimes hard. It's always hard. <laughs> right? <laughs> In this case, it doesn't say anything that points um, one A and B. It then says like, and two. I mean, again, yeah, you would do research. I mean, this is not something you just don't want to duck, right? You would look at the tax implications if someone pays gift tax. And you do searches. Ashley. In practice, um, usually you do research. I'm just really curious what other sources you use. Do you usually just go strictly by the code or do you have to? No, when I, I mean, I always go to secondary sources. Okay. I do research for clients, which means <coughs> CCH, RIA, and I do electronic searches. And I try to tease. You know, I look at the code, I look at the regulations, and then if I can't get, and even if I find what I think is the answer in the code and the regulations, I, I'm totally fallible. So what I mean is, psychologically, there's a lot of money's at stake. I want to see second and third opinions that confirm my gut. Okay, so again, I rarely, you know, rarely would just go on my reading of the code or regulations. I want to see other people, what they have to say. So question B, what does shelter as basis in the apartment? Okay, what is shelter as basis in the apartment? In this case, Michael. Busco, what's your basis? So you get Busco? 320, Michael, agree or disagree? I agree. What's your authority, Michael? Um, not sure. Busco, what's your authority? Would you agree, Alicia? No. Ten twelve, right? Also, mm -hmm. don't say ten sixteen because there's no adjustments here, right? You're just acquiring the property, right? Everyone good? Right? 
80. Yeah. All right, so you, you, you're going to buy it for 80,000 cash, but subject to 120,000 mortgage. What's your basis in the property, Lewis? 200,000. Okay, 200,000, construction 1012. On which neither she nor Gaynor was ever personally liable, it's not a recourse, or ever paid it any amount of principal. And then relative paid $30,000 of tax, okay, gift tax, okay? $30,000 of gift tax. Um, <coughs> so picture, if you will, Lewis is going to give this property to Annetta, right? But this time he's giving it um, something to the liability, agreed? And Annette is, again, selling the property for $200,000 of cash to FUSTA, right? So in this case, um, Tina, Alana, what's the amount realized here? When Annette sells his property, What's her amount realized? Tina? Three twenty. Three twenty. You want to agree or disagree? Appreciate in Lewis's hands. 
He bought it for 200, right? And it went up to 300. The appreciation here, right, <coughs> Joanne, is truly 100. So I don't think you can change the numerator. Agreed? But I can, Annetta, role play here. Scenario one, where you get this property worth 300,000, not subject to liabilities. Are you happy? Could you hear her? She's happy, right? Everyone agree? She's whispering, but she's happy, okay? Everyone agree? Scenario one, she's happy. The first problem that we did, problem A, she's happy. And then, with problem C, on a scale, let's suppose on problem A, you are happy, your uh, utility, uh, utils, if you, John Stewart Mills, your, your happiness level was eight out of 10. And problem C, is your happiness level still an eight? Is it a nine or 10? Or is it a three or four? Five. It's a five. Why are you less happy? And by the way, David, should she be less happy in problem C? And then, you like to be happy, why are you a 9 or 10? Do I have to pay if I didn't Oh, hold on. So in the first scenario, she gets 300000 She's very happy. When she gets the apartment the second go around, Lewis, what did you give her? You didn't give her something worth 300000 You did, but it's subject in problem C to $120,000 of liability. Arguably, right? Arguably, we could say that... The amount of the gift, right? If you were talking to friends, if Annette were talking to friends, how much would you say to your friends you got as a gift? Because all your friends are going to say, gee, you got that property. How rich do you feel, Annette? Are you going to tell them you feel $300,000 richer or $180,000 richer? $180,000. And if we change the denominator, what will that cause the uh, basis adjustment to be? Bigger. And basis is good. So what would be the basis here instead of being 210? 216. <coughs> what would the number be here? 216. Is it 216667 <coughs> or something? Yeah. Something like that? And isn't that going to mitigate, reduce the overall amount? Recognize under code section 1001C. And I know what you're all thinking, right? What's my authority? Fair question. All right? Um, there is no good authority, okay? It's just a better reading, I think, of the code, okay? I don't think there's no letter rulings, there's no revenue rulings on this. But again, if the Supreme Court were asked to render a decision, what does what did Congress mean in the denominator by the amount of the gift? I think this is a, probably a better reading than to say the amount of the gift was 300000 So is that the perfect answer or not the perfect answer? If I were advising a client, I'd say, look, there's some risk. There's no authority directly on point. This is a fair reading of the statute. And that, are you OK with that? All right, because you're selling the property, so you're going to have to be comfortable with that. Brandon, you okay with that? Raphael, you're good? <coughs> Jing. All right, that closes the book on chapter six. Any other questions on chapter six? Ready to move on? And move on to chapter 21. Now, fear not. I've done this on many, many occasions, okay? Um, and by skipping up through chapter 21, as a student, I would be concerned, like, I've only skipped so many chapters, are we going to get lost? You're not going to get lost, I promise you. There's nothing in chapter 1 that requires that you have as a foundation in your earlier parts. Okay, so um, you're not. The reason I want to go to chapter 21 is that um, in chapter 21, 
Once we figure out numerically what is the amount of the gain or loss, okay, right? We just went through that exercise under Code Section 1001. Agree? Mm -hmm. We figured out the numerically correct answer. We have to now figure out the uh, uh, character of that income, right? The qualitative answer. What is the character of that income? So once we compute the amount of the gain or loss, our next job is to figure out the character of the income. And one of the first things the authors present us with are what are capital gains and losses, right? Now, first of all, are capital gains versus ordinary income? Is there a great difference between these kinds of income? And uh, Larry, is there a rate difference? What's your, what's your <coughs> is there a rate difference between ordinary income and capital gain? Um, I don't think there's a clear cut. You don't think what? I don't think there's a clear cut, but like black and white. There so, isn't? Tarina, do you agree? No, I thought capital gain. You thought capital gains right on the start? Yeah, it's 12% rate. 12%? We're talking about the country. Michael? Well, from where I was reading, it's different. Right now, it's like 50% for most people for capital gains, and 20% for over a specific amount of income. So you're talking about the tax rate. Tax rate. So the capital gains tax rate could be up to 20% of the so it could generally it's 15%, it could be up to 20%. All right, let me then turn the question around and say, what's the highest rate, Larry, on the quarter area income currently? So for we'll, we'll Richard, this is 39%. Is that the correct answer, Katie? 35. But yeah, 35, 39. 39.6%. Where would you find that? All right, Katie, what, where would you find that? Say again, Nick? I, I, I looked it up. Actually, I actually had a Google on the last time I looked it up. Where, you don't have to Google. Where do you yeah. find it? Let's go. 1C. 1C. Go section 1. Go section 1. Yes. Go section one. Okay. Gives us the ordinary, the highest rate being 39.6. Agreed? Yes. Capital gains rates, yes, there's a range. <coughs> And depending on your income threshold, it can be anywhere from 0% to 20%. Many high income taxpayers pay 20%, and because of the net investment tax under Code Section 1411, there's an additional 3.8% tax. There is a higher tax, excuse me, for capital gains. If it's a collectible, it's 28%. Now, let's see if we can go through this exercise for my mental assuagement. Um, and if you can, don't fence it. Raise your hand, raise your hand high. How many people, given you just saw, capital gains are essentially taxed at one half the rate of ordinary income? Everybody agree? Approximately, give or take. From a policy perspective, how many of you think strongly that capital gains should be accorded this preferential rate? And then on my next question, just to give you a heads up, how many of you say that capital gains and ordinary income should be taxed at the same rate? So first question, how many of you feel that there should be a rate print preference accorded capital gains? So how many say not? <coughs> So the knots are in the, the minority, right? Everyone agree? Overwhelmingly, you guys say that there should be a rate preference. Nick, you raise your hand very quickly. What can you name justification? Well, for me, it would be you're doing more above what your normal normal income would be. Uh, from what I from the way I or understand it, have the means that collects your investment. So that's what you mean by that. Well, Rental properties, for example, if it's not my main source of income, it's not my main business, uh, as to where. So I'm just curious, why would it? I'm just, I'm not. 
My rationale is extra, it's extra tax that you're, you're drawing from. Even though you couldn't construe it for your income, it's extra tax that you're drawing from me. It's not, and the rental property, for example, are passive. But what? Passive income, from what I understand it to be but, but why give a preference? I, I mean, the fact is, maybe not, I mean, you can earn more. <coughs> some people do, when it's not their primary job. Um, why you afford capital gains, special rates in those instances? I mean, some people might win more from gambling. Is that we don't give gambling winnings preferential rates, even though it's a secondary source of income, right? So I'm not sure if that justifies it. I, uh, I mean, people against it, but it's more risky, I guess, to invest in. It's more risky. Only the stock market, because capital gains is not only the stock market. But primarily stock market, let's admit it, Diana. Okay, but it's not always, I mean, it is stock market, but land and other capital assets also according to capital gain treatment, so uh, less. Well, your, your original income was taxed at, say, like 39 36%, right? And that extra, that money left over after you paid your tax, you're taking a risk of buying just a land for investment. Okay, so you're saying, but I mean, you could take the money and put it in a bank. <laughs> there's interest, but we don't get preferential rates to interest. Uh, but I think it, I mean, that extra capital is paying the economy. But, but let me just ask you, money in the bank, does it just sit in the bank or do banks uh, lend it? Well, it should be lent, but it might not. Yeah. Well, what? It should get lent, but it might not. Yeah. But banks aren't going to be in business wrong if they don't lend it out, right? Yeah. yeah. Got you? I think it's because it's good for, for the economy. Why? The rates stay low because it's that um, incentive uh, the commerce in parts. I mean, but by the same token, if you give that incentive, if you reduce the rates in general, it might cause people to put more effort into labor. So something's got to give. You want to keep your revenue neutral and collect X dollars, whatever that number is. Is it warranted to give capital gains a break? You're going to say, plus yeah, I feel like this only. To say less. So this only helps affluent individuals like hedge fund managers who have money to invest, but they don't have to actively participate in basically making money on the bonds. I mean, there is this two and twenty. Uh, there is carried interest. Rate. It's getting preferential rates, David. So versus the average Joe who gets taxed at ordinary income rate, he's paying more money than the hedge fund manager who's like basically pulling money but and paying a lower rate on taxes. So how does that? I, there, there is a. Capital gains, the, the benefit of capital gains, the preferential rate overwhelmingly inures <coughs> to those who are wealthy. There's no way to to me about that. David and then Ashley and then I'll make some comments. In, in, in the modern day when every Tom, Dick, and Harry has been convinced they should be invested in some way, we don't need these outdated laws to encourage more investments to spread the economy. Every dollar everyone gets is being invested 10 times over. Everyone, we've stopped having pensions, that's 401k, money is invested. Bank interest rates are at zero, so instead of go to mutual funds, that money's being invested. Everything's invested. We don't need to spur investment. Do you think it's well, spurring Ashley, and then I'll make some comments. I was going to say, I'm not saying it's fair or not fair, but I'm saying from a policy perspective, it's better to have capital gains rates that are at a higher I mean, let's just make some observations, or we could talk, I know, all night about this, and you're not going to be well served by that. All right, one argument might be this bunching effect, right? That this income that you earn, suppose you invest in Google stock, you bought it uh, today for $100, and it appreciates in value of $100 over the next 10 years, uh, or nine years, so it appreciates from 100 to 1,000, right? And then you sell it. And all nine hundred dollars worth of the gain is captured in one year, and it's, there's a bunching effect. So you go up the rate structure, right? So there's an argument to say, "Gee, um, we're going to have all this income that was earned over ten years um, taxable in one year." Now, that's an argument in favor of having a reduced rate. It's very arbitrary, obviously, because you just um, 
if the person holds it for two or three years versus holding it for 60 years, you're still giving the same break, notwithstanding uh, the length of time. But query, take for example a lawyer who works on a tort action. It takes him or her nine years of hard work to produce a favorable settlement. Isn't that nine years worth of work all condensed into one year? So that income too would be bunched. So it's hard to justify the argument of bunching and say on the basis of bunching there should be a preferential rate. So hard to, hard to say. Uh, two, uh, people would argue that it juices up the economy, right? By having this reduced rate to incentivize people to invest in the market. Again, is that a fair statement? Why? Um, when Bill Gates and other entrepreneurs you know started up their, you know, Google, started up um, Apple, pick your company, do you think they had a clue what the capital gains rates were? Or it was just in their DNA to try to uh, set up these enterprises? And I would argue that, you know, a lot of people don't need these incentives to start up their, their enterprises. Um, there is this also something known as the lock-in effect, that people will hold their investments, right? Um, even if they think there's a better investment out there, if you knew, for example, that you had a, suppose you bought something and making the numbers really easy for essentially zero, it's now worth a thousand. And you have to pay 40% tax um, on this. And right now you're only commanding a 2% return in dividends, but and you see a better investment that you can get 10% return. You might not sell it to me, not a 10% return, a 3% return. So instead of having a 2% return, you'd like to get a 3% return. But right now, 2% on $1,000, if I do my arithmetic right, uh, is $20. If you see a better investment, 3%, uh, and the tax you only have $600, right? You're not going to make that investment because you're going to get a lower return because after tax, um, you have a, 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 um, some sort of this impediment. You're only going to be able to use $600 after tax. So some people say that you really need to create this uh, fluidity in the economy by having the capital gains uh, reduce rate. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of economists who go both ways on that. Long story short, let me just make an observation for all the people who raised their hand initially saying there should be a preferential rate. Did this country ever have a tax rate where ordinary income and capital gains were taxed at the same rate? And the answer is yes, in the 1986 Tax Act, capital gains and ordinary income were both taxed at the highest marginal rate, then marginal rate, of 28%. Guess what? That lasted for five years, during those five years. Did the country fall apart? Did people cease to invest in capital? Um, was there a big problem in, in having that sort of arrangement? And I would say for that half a decade, if you look at economic trends and the like, the country fared very well from 86 to 80, uh, 1991. So my point is, for those who take it as a religious <coughs> belief that there must be a capital gains preferential rate, um, just. I, I, I say without knowing definitively that um, the country did all right during that time period. So, Wes, you were going to comment? No, I mean, I see what you're saying, but I mean, if you look at what happened in the mid-90s, Well, if you look at the mid-90s, keep going? No, if you look at the mid-90s, I mean, I guess the you know, tax return capital gains were in order to reduce the You had a huge bull market, you know, mid-90s, late-90s, not the same thing. But I think if you had ordered uh, capital gains at 30, 40%, there'd be a lot less investment. Well, uh, no, let's just face it. Of it, 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 it. We could, I'm a big subscriber, reduce the tax rates. And one way to reduce the ordinary tax rates is to make the capital gain, tax, gains tax rates go up. So I'm not saying you make everything 40%, but if you can meet halfway, that might be a solution, Dave. Uh, I'd like to change sides and agree. I wouldn't want to deprive us all of riding this roller coaster of booms and crashes <laughs> by doing anything that might temper investment even the slightest bit. 
So you're saying, again, temporary investment by raising the capital gains. All right. I mean, look, we could argue this. The point I'm saying is, instead of taking it as religious belief that there should be a capital gains preferential rate, um, again, my only point is, and by the way, one other observation, then we'll get back to the material. I would attribute 25% of the code's girth to the complexity that's engendered by having this rate differential, that by having this special category and a reduction of half to tax rates, we, you know, when people can bemoan the complexity of the code, well, a large part is attributable to this rate difference. So, so let's kid not kid ourselves, we're our, our own worst enemy. And again, is it justified? All right, enough said, at least for tonight, we'll continue this as we, as we do. So, again, code section um, 1A, B, and C talk about ordinary income tax rates. Capital gains rates are found in code section 1H. Code section 1H, uh, define what are capital gains rates. And, and by the way, I will point out that um, on page 745, the authors make the observation that <coughs> capital gains rates have been all over the place. The holding period, currently, to get capital gains rates, what is the holding period? How long do you have to get hold, hold an asset for? Go ahead, Wes. Where do you look? Look at code section 1222. 1222. Matt, David, Adam, Diana. Hello, Leo. How long do you have to hold it for? One year or more. What the code says. What are you going to say? They're short term capital gain. I think I'm going to have to hold for one. I want to know long term. Uh, long term. Stop. It's not one year or more. It's more than one year. <laughs> but that, that's not what you said. Because if you tell a client one year or more, your client, if they sell it at one year, and they have to pay what it short term capital gains or tax like ordinary income. So that's a dangerous thing to tell a client. You give a client an inch, they'll take 100 miles, right? So be careful, right? The code is very specific. It must be more than one year. OK. Um, all right, so that's capital gains. How about capital losses? Well, capital losses can, can you just take capital losses whenever you wish? No, Luca, right? <coughs> what are the limitations on it? Uh, your gains. Up to your gains. If, and if you want an illustration, the authors give us a nice piece of legislative history on page 747. <coughs> legislative history where someone has income of 350000 they have a capital gain that year of 100000 and they would only have to pay 12500 to the government. But if they earn that same three hundred and fifty and they have a $100,000 capital loss and they could use that, they would yield a $58,000 worth of savings. So in other words, let me make this observation. If we had clients with you know, capital gains and capital losses, what would we tell them to do if, they're, if they could take their capital losses unlimited? We'd say, oh, year one, <coughs> take your capital gains. Year two, take your capital losses. Why? If you could get all your capital gains in this year, you'd get a you know, tax of 20%. Next year, use your capital losses against your ordinary income 
and you could shield and save taxes at 40%, right? So because you can manipulate the timing with respect to capital losses, Congress put the brakes on. So Code Section 1211, it's an important code section, 1211 limits your use of capital losses. If you're an individual, you can only take the first $3,000 of capital losses. If you're a corporation, you can't take any of your capital losses. You can only use them against your capital gains. Okay, so let me repeat. For individuals, you can take your first $3,000 of capital losses against ordinary income. You can always take capital losses against capital gains. That's section 1222. <coughs> but with respect to capital losses, for corporations, there's a, you can't take any capital losses except to the extent there's capital gains. Now, Diana, do you lose those capital losses? Do they just poof disappear if you can't use them? So you carry. What's your authority? Say so again, Annetta. Twelve, twelve. Corporations can carry back three years, carry forward five years, and individuals can keep carrying them forward until, until death. Okay? <coughs> Say again, Connie? Kind of? Okay, by the way, let me take a quick pause here because I hear it pointed out, and I want to point out that if I can interest you, uh, for those who are part of the tax program, uh, we're going to try to hold this event, and it, even if you're not part of the tax program, after class, we're going to have to see the debate. But next week, or send me an email on October 22nd. Uh, what better thing do you have? All you people who keep telling me you don't do anything over the weekends, I'm going to give you something to do. Uh, how many of you ever have been to a murder mystery? Okay, see? Uh, there is going to be on October 22nd, uh, we're having this event, one hour of continuing education credit. Uh, some former students from the tax program, one current student. Uh, we're going to, each one's going to give a short presentation. You can bring a significant other. And then we'll have dinner. And during dinner, uh, there's a theater company that gets the audience to participate and help figure out who committed a murder. All right, so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Code Section 1014. I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> uh, but if you're interested, many of you have got a solicitation from Kathleen Harmon. I tried to echo the sentiments that sign up today. Uh, bring a significant other. I will be there to meet my wife. Uh, and uh, if you're not part of the tax program and you still want to come, um, just shoot me an email and I'll make it my business that you get an e bike, okay? Any questions about that invitation? Any, anyone have any issues? I believe we're going to start at 4 or 4.30. All right? It should be fun. Never done I always try every year to have an event. Uh, and, um, I, last year, what did we, we had a Sunday morning brunch. And I had, uh, uh, I had a woman come in and speak about uh, how to be happier. Okay, uh, so we go from how to be happier to murder. Um, and I've had comedians and all sorts of things. So uh, it's my way to have some fun. And, and for people, I can't tell, I never saw this company in action. Um, but it should be fun. And even if it's a complete disaster, it's fun watching a train wreck, right? Um, so uh, consider coming October 22nd. Uh, and uh, it should be fun just uh, to me. It's going to be a night that combines the best of both worlds, some tax and dinner and, and a show. Who well, we could ask for more, right? All right, so any questions about the event, anything? If you do, shoot me an email, and uh, I'd love to see all of you, all right? All right, capital losses, we said. We have code section 1211, we have code section 1212. Uh, the author is talking about the mechanics of capital gains, computational. Um, let me make clear, for exam purposes, I will not ask one computational question. What do I mean by that? You will not see a question at the end, compute the person's 
tax liability for, uh, for year 2015, okay? Why? Um, that's because <coughs> you know, everyone knows that at the end of the day, if you get the right numbers, your computer will produce the right number, okay? No one in this room who practices tax in the year 2016 starts actually doing computations, okay? Um, and we could spend a half an hour, 45 minutes going through certain problems and doing that, but I don't think it's time well spent. But conceptually, you must know how to get to the right answer, okay? So my job is more to look at the bigger picture, not the minutia of number crunching, okay? So uh, if you have concerns about that, do not, you may have other concerns, but that should not be on the top of your list. So the author is on page 750, go through some computations, they talk about the different tax rates, and capital gains rates have several different tax rates, including a 28% rate on collectibles and a 25% rate on something called unrecaptured um, 1250 gains, okay? Um, I would tell you, for exam purposes, what is the assumed tax rate, so that that would be a known quantity. The authors on page 754 point out the netting process with Code Section 1H, which is done in a tax, favor, tax favorable way to the taxpayer. So having said that, let's look at page 755 because I just want you to get the fundamentals. Taxpayer has a salary of 50,000. He also has the following transactions, all of which are about uh, <coughs> uh, capital assets. A gain of 15,000 on the collectible held for two years, a gain of 20,000 on stock held for 15 months. Determine the amount of T's net capital gain. Well, last I checked, guys, the net capital gain here, surprise, surprise, is 35,000, right? And question B says, at what rate will the capital gain be taxed? Well, the 20,000 will be taxed, let's assume, at a rate of 15%, depends on the taxpayer's uh, income, right? Because it's from 1H, it could vary, it could be as high as 20%. Many taxpayers will be taxed at 15 or 20 percent. There's also a 28 percent tax rate on the collectible, right? That's all I care about. Can you handle that? Yes, you can handle that. Ignore question C, okay? I, I'm not going to ask you to run through an actual computation. Question two. S is a single taxpayer, is a high income taxpayer with a salary of 500000 in the current year. S also has the following transactions involving the sale of capital assets. Gain of 120 on the stock held for 15 months, a loss of 20000 on the stock held for three years. I assume there's a flat 30% on ordinary income, disregarding any deductions. Uh, what is S's as, as tax liability under Section 1? The only thing I'm going to just call to your attention, the only takeaway from here, is that you would net those two together, right? The gain of uh, 120 and the loss of 20, and here the taxpayer would have a net capital gain of 100,000, right? And depending on their income threshold, they'd have to pay a capital gains tax rate of 20%, right? That's it. So I want you to be able to do. Question three, taxpayer who's in the highest federal tax bracket in the current year has a $5,000 gain from the collectible and a $5,000 gain from stock, both held long term. What is taxpayer's net capital gain and how is it taxed if taxpayer also has a $5,000 loss from the collectible held long term? So keep in mind they have a $5,000 gain from the flexible, $5,000 gain from stock, 
and they have a $5,000 loss from flight pool. You have to knit similar categories against each other. That would leave $5,000 net capital gain from stock taxable at 20%, okay? So you have to net similar categories, right? Sure. Uh, it depends on the, I'm going to assume 20%. I would tell you. Okay, all right, you're not going to the class, but you make I'm not going to, I, I would tell you what rate to assume. Okay. All right? Lucas. Uh, when you say net similar categories, do you mean like at first net similar categories until they're not available? Like, yes. You know, so yeah. like. Lucas, you'll see. Okay. See, let me see if I can, as we go through, I think I'll answer your question. So here, the collectibles, similar nature, or identical nature, have to be net. Okay? Question B. Same results in A above. If it's, what results in A above if the taxpayer's $5,000 losses from stock held long term? Well, then the stock would be net, net right? Look good together, leaving $5,000 taxable at 28%, right? Lewis? Yeah. Okay? Everyone see that? Question C. What results in A above taxpayer uh, $5,000 loss is held from stock um, held for nine months rather than from the collective? So uh, the loss is a short term capital loss. Is it one year or more? <coughs> and here, that is not considered part of the same category as the capital gain. So you can use this short-term capital loss against the collectible. Okay, this would not be the same, considered the same category as the long-term capital gain. And therefore, this short-term capital loss be netted against the collectible. And that would be the gain taxable at the 20% assumed capital gains rate. So it would be $5,000 taxable at 20%. And if there was no collectible, then we would measure against the lower capital. Yeah, we, if there's no collectible. Well, look at question D. What if the taxpayer's net cap? What is the taxpayer's net capital gain? Then how is the tax taxpayer's five thousand dollar gain from a collectible, five thousand dollar unrecaptured twelve fifty five twelve fifty gain? So the first gain is taxable twenty eight percent. The second gain is taxable at twenty five percent. $5,000 gain from stock, which is taxed about 20%, and a $10,000 loss from stock, all held long term. So <clears throat> they're all different categories, agree? And um, what, excuse me, let me stand corrected, I apologize. We have three different categories of gain and one category of loss, the stock. That must first be netted against the capital gain of the stock, right? The remaining 5,000 can be netted in a pro taxpayer fashion to reduce the 28% rate before the 25% rate. Let me repeat that. The collectible is tax plus 28%. The 1250 gain is tax plus 25%. The capital gain from stock is tax plus 20%. You must first net against similar categories. So the $10,000 in loss, the first $5,000 and $10,000 is going to be netted against the stock, right? The other $5,000 can be netted in a pro taxpayer fashion. Are you going to net it against the 28% rate or the 25% rate? Of course, you're going to net it against the 28% rate, leaving the, the $5,000 tax flow at 25%. And if you look on page 754, 755 with the netting, the authors give us in footnote 38 the authority for why this netting process is permissible. Permissible. Okay. And if you go through footnote 40 and 41, they show some more examples, okay, of the netting process. So, message. I'm not going to get into intricate computational problems. Okay, guys? 
You're not going to see it. Let's look at uh, capital losses. Page 756. We spoke before about the need for Congress to put the brakes on taxpayers willy-nilly taking capital losses, right? Because otherwise, taxpayers would uh, strategically gain the system, right? They take gains in one year's loss in the other. Code section 1211 puts the brakes on. 1212 permits a carry, carry back and carry forward. What if you have short-term and long-term capital losses? What if you have long-term and short-term capital losses? Which get used in the current year and which must be carried forward? Everyone hear my question? If you have short-term and long-term capital losses, and remember, individuals are, are able to use the first 3,000, right, of their losses. Which losses get used and which ones have to be carried forward? Say again? Short term get carried forward? Which one do you use first? The long term? Short term authority? Short term recession. So I'll tell you to Okay, Busto, I think Sylvia. Busto has authority, put section 1212B2 for the proposition that you must use your short term first and you carry forward your long term. The bias is towards carrying forward the long term. Okay? The bias is towards carrying forward the long term. So we're going to see an illustration of this in the first problem. Look on page 761. Year, an amount equal to the lesser of 
The amount allowed for the tax per year under paragraph 1 or 2 of section 1211B or the adjusted taxable income for such years. In this case, all this is doing, 1212B2, is artificially creating a short-term capital gain. Not that it's going to show up in the tax return. I promise you, it's not going to show up in the tax return. All it's doing is saying, in this case, create a 3,000 short-term capital gain. And by doing that, it will tell you what the excess is to be carried over for the next year. And if you had a $3,000 short-term capital gain, guess what you would be carrying forward next year? 7,000 of long-term capital loss. So also, this is here purely as a filler to figure out the carry forward. It has nothing to do with what ends up on the tax return. It has everything to do with just trying to artificially create uh, or, or, or help you figure out what you're going to carry forward. Okay? That's it. Period. So if you want a rule of thumb, the rule of thumb is always use your short term in the current year and carry forward the, or the code forces you carry forward the long term for the following year. Okay? There's a policy behind this. Because the next year, will the long term capital loss, is that good or bad for the taxpayer? Long term capital loss. It's not good for the taxpayer because it's going to absorb more of the capital gain, the long term capital gain, which gets the rate trackers, right? So it's actually. This is done in a way that doesn't work the taxpayer's favor. Okay? Think about it. This is a way it doesn't work to the taxpayer's favor. All right. Code section. Let's talk. We figured out that there's a rate preference for capital gains. There's limitations for capital losses. But the elephant in the room is, what is a capital asset, right? What is a capital asset? So where would we look to know where is the capital asset? Uh, Joanne, Stephanie? Is a capital asset? Yeah, what is a capital asset? Where do you look? 1221. 1221, which is entitled what, Stephanie? Uh, capital asset. Capital Probably a good place to look. Everyone agree? Mm -hmm. Stephanie, or uh, Connie. Capital asset, broad or narrow? Broad? Tarina, do you agree? Say again? Everything narrow. Narrow. Raphael, who's right? I would say. He doesn't it start off by driving everything's a capital asset, right? Everything in the world is a capital asset, right? Except as follows, right? So it starts off broadly. What are the big, in my world, there's three big exceptions. What is the biggest exception to the definition of what is a capital asset? Counts receivable is one. Even bigger. Inventory is the biggest, right? Everyone agrees when Home Depot, Lowe's, your supermarket sells you items, they don't report capital gains, right? It's all ordinary income, agreed? All right, so we have Accounts receivable inventory in the third and another big category of non capital assets? Machinery. Machinery. Equipment. Otherwise known, if you guys at the, at the water cooler or at cocktail parties, what do you call planted machinery by code number? <coughs> Say again? One, six, seven. Well, that's depreciation. But what name, what name do you put to planted equipment? If you want to sound cool at the water cooler. <coughs> 1231 assets. 
right? The 1231 assets. And they are not capital assets. They are better than capital assets. All right? So we'll learn. Even though they're not capital assets, everybody you agree with me. They're not capital assets. They're specifically not considered capital assets. Agree? But we will see soon enough they get treatment even better than capital assets. All right, we're gonna, the authors are going to give us a few cases, and I'll share a quick story of my own uh, about what is the capital asset. Now, Maud Levy, Commissioner, what happens here? In a nutshell, what happens here? <coughs> okay. Focus. Uh, he performed two business, uh, businesses on a piece of land he bought, and they wanted to, uh, he, he thought that um, his profits were capital assets, so that the government thought it was ordinary income. All right, so you got a taxpayer who's a veterinarian, buy some land. Doesn't make it worth much, can't sell it, at least initially. So this is not his primary occupation, this is his secondary job, right? And subsequently, does the land become valuable, Luca? Yeah, when he wants to sell it. He wants to sell it, and then subsequently, he starts subdividing it, right? And then selling off pieces of land, and he treats it as a capital gain, the income he earns. The IRS says, no, not so fast. Why? How does the IRS say it should be handled? Treat it. Sylvia? <coughs> How, what, what, what would be the character income to the IRS? Ordinary. Ordinary income. Why? What would it call it? No, no, but I mean, it, why would it, the IRS under 1221 say it's ordinary? Under Code Section 1221. Luca? It was the ordinary course of this trade or business. So mm -hmm. the IRS is calling this inventory, right? So <coughs> well, put the, you got to put the right label on it, right? Right? Call it inventory and say so this is tax plus inventory. Luca, who wins and why? Um, government wins because uh, selling the land was how he realized his profit, not by his labor, not by his lumber business. Right, there was a number of continuity and frequency of sales. All of a sudden, even though initially he may have initially bought it for investment purposes, that doesn't control what the person initially, just like when you give a gift, uh, you may not know the donor's intent here, they say don't block, right? At the person's intentions, whether it was in for investment initially or not. At some point it was transformed, and maybe this investment at some point became inventory. <coughs> it did. So the court rules this to be ordinary income. Now, parenthetically, you may want to write into your book or in your notes. Subsequently, Congress came back and instituted Code Section 1237. I want to turn it, take a look at 1237. 1237 essentially says that if you don't substantially improve property, and you sell five or fewer lots and you hold the property for um, more than five years, and you can get capital gains. So this is a pro-taxpayer provision, right? Position 1237. Even if you sell more than five, it <coughs> treats a certain portion as ordinary income. So I just want to call to your attention that Congress sometimes, right, can come back and write a favorable code section. Can uh, if it chooses, right? So, Maudlin held the ordinary income. Malapie Riddle, this is a Supreme Court decision. What is the focus of this decision?
focus of this decision is what does the word primarily mean, right? If you look at the definition of recall 21 of inventory, it has to be primarily for sale to customers. And the IRS was taking the position that the word primarily meant substantial reason. And what does the Supreme Court say is the appropriate standard? What does the word primarily mean? <coughs> primarily means, and um, if you look on page 767, the last, the, the carryover paragraph, the last sentence says, we hold that as used in Code Section 1221, primarily means of quote unquote first importance or principally. Okay, everyone see that? Quick story, and then we'll move on to one more, or two more cases. <coughs> is that um, everyone knows where St. Barnabas Hospital is? Yeah. It's in Livingston. And if you are a family member ever has severe burns, that's the number, New Jersey's number one burn center. That's where you get uh, helicopters too. So that's not my story today. About 10 years ago, I was reading the front page of the New York Times, and they were talking about that St. Barnabas Hospital. They were paying women uh, $5,000 for their eggs, to remove their eggs. An interesting article um, about the sale of their eggs. And where did my brain go? Was <laughs> <laughs> oh, that Alicia? I want to know how those women are taxed, <laughs> right? So I called up. I happen to know the head of the infertility clinic um, at St. Barnabas, and I said, "Paul, how are these women being taxed?" And what do you think Paul told me? I don't know. <laughs> Well, he said they're being issued 1099 miscellaneous. Why? Because they're being quote unquote paid for their services. Why? Anyone? And you can you don't have to say you yourself. You can say your friend. Um, is it easy or hard for the women out there to give your eggs? Is it easy or hard? It's hard. It's hard. You got to be pumped with Clomid, and the harvesting process is not easy. Okay, so. Um, and St. Barnabas doesn't want to look like it's in the business of buying babies, right? Mm -hmm. So all those things politically and payment for services, uh, they wanted to package it as payment for services, right? Okay. But six months later, there's also featured articles saying that there are people on Craigslist looking for Tall Ivy League graduate with blue eyes willing to pay fifty thousand for those eggs. Oh my God. Okay, so at that stage, at some point, it's going to be a payment not just for services. Everyone agree? Mm -hmm. How would you treat that fifty thousand? Would you treat it as ordinary income or capital gains? Ordinary. And Wes, you said ordinary. Why? Well, that doesn't that doesn't <laughs> where, would you, where would you look? Where would you look with the right answer? What code section? You want to look at 1001 for character that just talks about computationally what is the amount of the Well, where would you look, Anna? Well, where would you look? 1221, right? And, and at least your starting point would be everything's a capital asset, right? <coughs> but couldn't it fall within the scope of an exception. And if so, which one? Inventory, right? <laughs> okay, and then <coughs> the women in the room are supposed to say who's going to distinguish their eggs from regular inventory? Anyone? Or are you going to say your eggs are inventory? Well, right. Nick's right. This is distinguishable because every woman in this room has, they're not replenishable, right? When you think of inventory, you think of something that's replenishable, agree? And your eggs cannot be replenished. So there's a distinction. Equipment. Oh, sorry. I've been paying service equipment machinery. 
All right, so now I wanted to test case on this, okay? Um, and I met someone when I, I wrote, subsequently wrote an article if you having trouble sleeping at night, here's another one added to your list of things you can read that I've written. Um, and um, and I, this woman who I met said, oh yeah, I just sold my eggs. I said, great, I want you to report them as capital gains, put it on schedule D, and it, that'd be terrific. But she was an aspiring actress, and this was the fifth time she sold her eggs. She's not a good <coughs> candidate. And by the way, you're not supposed to sell your eggs more than once in your life. It's not something healthy to routinely get juiced up on clothing. Um, so she wasn't the case, but if you want to Google Paris v. Commissioner, P-E-R-E-Z, this really frustrated me. Why? A woman sold her eggs, and she took the position she had no taxable income. That this was simply under Code Section 104, that this was simply a return of her human capital, okay? And that therefore, she should not pay any tax. But to me, this was very poorly lawyered. Why? Because you always have a plan B. When you read these cases, virtually every case says, look, if you don't win on this issue, then we want to consider this. This lawyer never argued. Hey, if this is not taxable, at the very least, she should have a capital gain and not ordinary income. So you can read the Paris case. It was just out last year. But this issue remains unresolved. So if anyone in this room or a friend of yours sells their eggs, it's still open. I, I'll take the case pro bono, OK? <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm still waiting. Page 769, quick. Remember, Code Section 1222 says, if you look at Code Section 1222, you must have a capital asset. That capital asset must be held at a more than one year, not one year or more, more than one year. And there must be a sale or exchange. In Keenan v. Commissioner, in Keenan v. Commissioner, The taxpayer had to pay a debt. Taxpayer had to pay a debt. If you pay a debt with an appreciated property, what did we learn from the first case that we looked at tonight? If you pay a debt, if you owe five million dollars and you pay it with Google stock you bought for four million, that it's now worth five million. Is that considered a sale or exchange? And the answer is yes. What's my authority? This Kingdom case is renowned, renowned for that proposition that if you use appreciated property to satisfy a request, it constitutes a sale or exchange. Why? It's as if the person sold the Google stock, got the five million, and paid off that debt with the proceeds. All right? So, um, Kenan stands for that very simple proposition. We then have the Hudson v. Commissioner case. In Hudson v. Commissioner, I'm a big subscriber to the notion that you have a picture diagram. And I will draw this out, but we had Mary had a judgment against Herbert Cole for $75,000. And Mary dies, so we put a big X through Mary. And Mr. Hudson was able to buy that judgment against Howard Cole, that $75,000 judgment for $11,000. Why was he able to buy a $75,000 judgment for $11,000? Because he was probably a deadbeat, and no one thought they could collect any money. <clears throat> so the estate was happy to get, you know, 15 cents on the dollar. Everyone agree? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, how much does Hudson get paid? 21. 21. 21. Gets 21,000. He does not get paid the whole thing. No. 
is K21 test. And the question the court has to resolve here is what is the character of that $10,000 gain, right? How does he, Calvin Hudson, want to treat it? He wants to treat it as a capital gain, right? Mm -hmm. But the court says, look, remember, he's just holding a judgment, and when he paid the $21,000, the judgment is extinguished. The court says there's no sale or exchange, right? If you don't have a sale or exchange, you don't get to the promised land. Everyone under, you see, if, under Code Section 1222, it requires that there be a sale or exchange for you to get to the promised land of having a net capital gain. So ultimately, James, how is this treated? Ordinary income. Ordinary income, right? One of the elements is missing, so therefore it's going to be treated as ordinary income. James, do you recall this? Can Congress do a little tweaking here? If you look at Code Section 1271, final look for the night. missing link, Congress legislatively overturns Galvin Hudson. Right? Just like it did with the model in addition, uh, we have now Code Section 1237, Congress periodically can go back and create a tax favorable outcome. For next class, guys, We'll not get through the entirety of chapter 21, we'll, we'll make tremendous headway, at least that's my aspiration.